PayPal stock, they reported earnings this morning. I want to go over the rough numbers here with you guys, kind of let you know and react to these numbers and let you know my opinion on them, kind of what my thoughts are. Then I want to go ahead and react to this one here. Automakers face tough choices on pricing or volume in Q1. I'm looking forward to getting into that one. I think it's an important video talking about the overall auto market. So many times everybody gets caught up into just what's going on with Tesla, but there's, there's bigger things going on outside of just Tesla in the auto market right now. Jim Grant, there's as much of a chance of a rate hut rate rate hike as there is two rate cuts. I'm looking forward to getting to that one. And the last one up here, I actually want to get into this one. Mad Dash, uh, Kramer talking about NVIDIA here. Appreciate everybody joining me. As always, I want to get jump straight in. This is a busy day for me. Smash a like. Make sure you're subscribed. I got a Twitch live stream right after this uh, for Amazon earnings, AMD, Super Micro, Starbucks. So that'll be pinned comment down there if you want to join me. Busy, busy day. Okay. So looking at PayPal's raw numbers here. Okay. First off, total payment volume up 14%. That's on an FX neutral basis. So that's the most like <laughs> you know perfect number you can kind of get. Up 14% year over year. We will take that. That's a very good total payment volume number there. On a gap basis, rev- net revenues were up 9% for the company. Transaction margin dollars up 4% for the company. Operating, which has been kind of one of the, the very weak spots that if you were bearish on the stock, you kind of point at, but that seems to be getting in a better place. Operating income up 17% year over year for the company. Operating margin up 98 basis points. Net income up 12%. And this is all on a gap basis, a generally accepting accounting principle. So this is, you know, you can't really, you can't fool with stuff when you're, you're on a gap basis, right? EPS up 18%. So you might say, okay, if their net income's up 12%, how's their EPS up 18%, right? Share buybacks. Share buybacks. Net cash provided by operating activities up a whopping 64% year over year. On a non-GAAP basis, net revenues up 9%, 10% on FX FX neutral basis. Transaction margin dollars 4%, operating income up 15%, operating margin up 84 basis points, net income up 20%. Earnings per share up 27%, free cash flow up 76% oh, year over year, and adjusted free cash flow up a whopping 86% year over year. As far as the guide went, they got it for, you know, we can call it 6 to 7% revenue growth next quarter. And it seems like they keep taking these kind of conservative numbers so then they come in and beat them, which is once again a small, smart thing. EPS 83 cents compared to 92 cents prior year, but keep in mind the prior year had a 9 cent benefit there. And once again, I think they're taking a conservative stance there. Okay. Now, the most exciting thing I thought was listen to the first 10 minutes of the PayPal conference call. You can do that on 1000xstocks.com, by the way. Listen to that first 10 minutes of the conference call, right? It's amazing. And the reason it's amazing is you listen to Alex Chris talk, okay? And he talks like, you know, this is just like early, early, like we got so much more work to do, like not impressed by these numbers at all. Not in, like, like literally you would think they, their, their revenues were going down and their profitability was going down or something, the way that man was talking, and so his aspirations for where he's taken PayPal is so far beyond where this company's at today. It's incredible. And also you listen to all the ways he's planning on improving PayPal and Venmo and making the product stickier. Oh my gosh. And so, you know, and I'll go much more in depth on PayPal tonight when I got some more time on my hands after Amazon earnings and all that. And we'll talk more in depth about everything on the main channel. But I got to tell you guys, I walked away from this earnings way more bullish than I already was on PayPal. Given the numbers and given that first 10 to 15 minutes of that conference call and hearing Alex Chris talk about his views on the business and where he thinks he can take things, oh my gosh, absolutely extraordinary. So I am extremely, extremely excited about the long term for PayPal. And honestly, these short term numbers are still pretty dang impressive. I know Alex Chris might not be impressed by them. But net income up 12% year over year, EPS up 18%, net, ca- net cash provided by operating activity up 64%. These are all on a gap basis. Total payment volume up 14%. To me, that's impressive. I, especially for a stock that's at a forward P of 12. And so when I hear a man that's not impressed by these numbers and he's got way bigger aspirations, oh man, I'm excited. All right, next one up here. Automakers face tough choices on pricing or volume in Q1. All up for us. And I bet I'll have some questions on Tesla for you at the end of that too, Phil. Sure. 
Well, David, let's start first off with most of these being European automakers, though in the case of Stellantis, obviously they own Jeep and Ram here in the U.S., and so it's more of a global automaker, and they're all global in some respect. But let's start first off with Stellantis. Remember, the story has been for much of the last six months, you either cut price or you cut volume. And they've decided they're not cutting price. So look what happened with delivery volumes in the first quarter for Stellantis. In total, down 9.6%. In Europe, down 6.8%. Though we should point out, here in the U.S., deliveries up 5.9%. They also have affirmed their full-year earnings guidance. But this was a revenue miss. So as you take a look at shares of Stellantis, the inventory continues to build, especially in certain regions around the world. That's going to be a focus for them. And as a result, you see shares down more than 8%. Let's shift gears to Volkswagen. Q1 sales. These are nothing great to write home about. Volkswagen overall down 4%, Porsche down 7%, the Audi brand down 11%. A number of one-time issues impacted their Q1 results, and as a result, the earnings were just shy of estimates. As you take a look at shares of Volkswagen, it did reaffirm its guidance for all of 2024. That's not enough for investors right now, down more than 4%. Guys, I need you to know this in regards to these other automakers. This is just the start of the pain for them. It's just the start. you got to understand how different traditional automakers are versus somebody like a Tesla. Tesla sells direct to a consumer. You go buy something on a website. So they're going to feel pain way before anybody else feels pain. These automakers, their customer is not me and you. Their customer is a dealership. Okay, So they can send inventory and inventory and inventory to the dealerships until those lots are full, which they are full and maxed out now at this point in time. I can tell you that much. Go buy any dealership. I've seen them in Arizona. I've seen them in Vegas. They are loaded with inventory. Watch some of the people that cover the auto industry and they'll show you lots all around from the Northeast down South. Lots are packed. Dealerships are packed with inventory. I mean, absolutely packed with inventory. So what's going to transpire over this next several quarters is you're going to witness all these other big auto manufacturers start to feel the pain of like, whoa, <laughs> like, like, like the dealerships are not taking our, 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 our you know, models anymore. So that is very significant. And it's a similar story at Mercedes-Benz. Their Q1 earnings actually did top estimates, but... People are looking at this and they're saying, that's fine. You've also reaffirmed your guidance for all of 2024. In general, people are not crazy. And I say people, investors, are not crazy about the setup in the auto industry right now. And again, it's about either pricing or volume, David. And that's what we're seeing the automakers facing a choice on, certainly in the first quarter. And that's likely continuing here well into the second and the third quarter. Any of these automakers that have had gains so far this year will likely lose lose all those gains within the next uh, few months in my opinion well as promised uh, i'd love to get your take on you know these recent reports regarding uh tesla in terms of more yep. job cuts and uh, another batch of potentially senior executives as well you know what do you make of it phil um remember the reports that came out when they announced the 10 percent job cuts and it was reported in a number of different areas that elon musk wanted to do 20 percent but had to be talked out of it i think we're seeing elon saying i don't think we cut far enough and that's why two senior executives according to the information were let go uh from the company they're dissolving essentially the people who are working under the one executive in charge of the supercharger network uh they've also had people who are working in government affairs that unit the, the executive was let go last week or stepped down last week, and they've let those uh, individuals go. I'm not surprised, David. If Elon wanted to cut more and they said, no, let's, let's hold it at about 10 percent, I'm sure Elon said to himself, oh, no, I think there's more areas where we can cut, and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, you know, uh, Elon, uh, I don't think people realize, and when it comes to Elon Musk, the man He's a brutal businessman. And, you know, I don't think people really look at him like that. They kind of look at him as just like, oh, you know, he sends tweets out and he says this and he says that. And he's just, you know, uh, the band's a brutal businessman. You don't get that level of success without being an absolutely brutal businessman. And he is. Um, and so I think that's just very important. He's actually, I think he's one of the most brutal businessmen uh, I've studied in the past 15 plus years. Just people don't. They don't really understand everything that's going on there, so they don't really, like, get it. But trust me, that man is, is – he's as tough as it gets when it comes to being a businessman, okay? All right, next one up here. There's much of a chance of a rate hike as there are two cuts. 
data, the economy, uh, and the Fed meeting that kicks off today. Seth Carpenter, global chief economist at Morgan Stanley, and Jim Grant, that. founder and editor of Grant's Interest Rate uh, Observer. And uh, good to have you both on set. So uh, unlike when we're remote, I can throw out a question, and I don't have to say who I'm throwing it out to because <laughs> you're both here. Do either of you uh, think we're going to have rate cuts this year? Who wants to start? Jim, should we? I think that um, uh, a little modesty is appropriate because only four months ago there were going to be six. <laughs> no. yeah. So I, I think that the future is perhaps not for the first time indeterminate. I think that uh, an interesting question is whether we might have a hike. Me too. And I, I think that uh, uh, you know, the, the zero probability assigned to that outcome only a few months ago I thought was excessive or inadequate. And I think that there is as much a chance of a hike as there is of two rate cuts and perhaps as much as one. Well, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, we've got, we got to get this straight, as a great anchor uh, once said. Uh, so either two rate cuts or we might get a hike. I mean, the market, it, it's going to matter. It's going to matter, and it's going to matter a lot. Yeah, so the issue is, if you're even thinking about two cuts this year, here's the issue, okay? And I was originally thinking, oh, the first rate cut announcement, probably July. That's what I was thinking maybe three, four months ago. Now I'm questioning that. And the reason being is, based upon CPI, I don't know how CPI gets to under three by July. And I, th my opinion is the Fed wants to see CPI under three for three months in a row before they cut. That's my personal opinion. I don't know. Maybe they, they have some different plans, but that's what I think. I do not think the Fed wants to cut interest rates when you still have CPI a 3% plus. I think they're going to feel kind of clownish doing that, okay? They've got, I think they've got to see twos. And so do we get to twos by July? I mean, looking at it now, it doesn't look that super realistic, right? And if we do, maybe it's one month. And so if you hit one month of, let's say, a 2.9, does the Fed, is, can the Fed cut with a one month at a 2.9? Even if we get there, I don't know. I think they got to see a few months of that kind of played out in a row, right? And so then that takes you to maybe out to the fall time, right, for maybe the first rate cut. And maybe that's, maybe that's when it transpires. But um, then you can't get to two cuts. If you Let's say they cut the first cuts in, in October, or let's say it's November. So let's say the first cut actually comes in November at some point in time, right? You're not going to have enough time to do another cut then. So that puts you at one rate cut. So honestly, what, what Grant says there, I actually kind of agree with. There probably is just as much of a chance of a, of a rate hike as there's two rate cuts this year, because now it's looking more like maybe one. Jim's point about how much repricing we've seen over the past four months is absolutely critical, and I suspect we're going to see same types of size. Hey, how's this man's head like glistening like that? I need to get my head like that, man. How you do that? Let me know. Let me know. I'll take the under in terms of Jim's forecast, but that's entirely predicated on our view of where inflation is going from here. I think the ECI number is, is really important, but if you spend a lot of time uh, with the data because you don't get invited to parties, then w what comes out is usually it's the consumer price inflation that drives wages and ECI as opposed mm -hmm. to the other direction. And so we're pretty convicted that inflation keeps coming down from here over the rest of this year, and that's why we're sort of leaning into there being probably even three cuts this year. As we've three seen. cuts. I mean, just in all due respect, how do you get there? It just, I mean, is you to to feel like there's going to be three cuts? One, the Fed needs to cut very soon, to that even to make sense. But two, you 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 to believe that you have to believe that the Fed's going to start cutting rates when CPI is in the three still. And how is a Fed going to cut when their mandate is two percent CPI, right? So you can make an argument at least if it's in the twos, but how are they going to cut if CPI is in the threes? And right now we're at what three point five. So that's that's you know that's just that's tough, tough. Number after number come uh, in the last couple of months. It, it, have you wavered at all? Have any of them caused you to say maybe our thesis, our, our you know primary thing we're talking about isn't isn't really happening? Uh Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, the characterization of people being always confident but never right, that's not the place you want to be. And so I think you have to have humility, as, as Jim was saying. Uh, I think the tricky part, though, is if we break down the components of inflation, it sort of lets us stay in the same place. So housing inflation, it's been coming down for a year. It's still elevated, but it's coming down. And all of the available data on current rents right now that the BLS is going to use to spread out for the next six, nine, and 12 months, 
that's clearly indicating that part is going to keep coming down. If we go to other services that Steve Leisman uh, highlighted, one of the key components holding that up is auto insurance, which has been on this jag for a while because people had to negotiate with their regulators and it's going to come off later this year, uh, but it's not driven by the current state of the economy. So we feel pretty good that things are coming down, but it's uncomfortable. What do you think, Tim? I think that uh, there is too much weight assigned to the rate of inflation and not enough to the level. So as William McChesney Martin said years and years ago, he said, um, you never recover the purchasing power you have lost to inflation. In times past, prices would rise, the average prices would, rise, the average prices would fall, but now, um, in the modern age, they always go up. And this helps to explain the dichotomy between uh, how people feel and how this kind of okay economy is presented statistically. And as recently as 1983, uh, borrowing costs were part of the CPI. They are out of it. But, you know, people are paying um, a lot for uh, uh, for mortgage rate, of course, but also for... Borrowing costs got taken borrowing. out. That yeah. makes zero sense. Because yeah. if you don't need that, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, they're out. and But, uh, you know, car payments, car loans are very uh, costly now and revolving credit, you know. So um, I think that the, uh, the inflation problem is uh, persistent and deep-rooted, not only in finance, but also in culture. Uh, inflation is a cultural phenomenon too. I think it's a, we do a something for nothing thing. Inflation, and right. a lot of that. We do for, we do forget that though. So that if someone goes, if someone on, you know, only has so much money and got four or five kids, and looking back two or three years ago, and they saw that we saw what happened with the forty year highs. If inflation drops to plus two percent, they're still at the supermarket, and you know the stuff that they were looking at last year that they already were having trouble making ends meet. It's 2% higher than that. We forget that. So inflation doesn't, when it comes down, it doesn't go down. I completely agree. And I think this is a key uh, tension between the perception about the economy and, and the reality of it. Right. Because people do look at the levels and people who want to buy a house, that young true. people, 25 to 35 years old, they look at the price <laughs> and the mortgage yeah. together. And that's why I think right. a lot of you, however, you know, we've been adding hundreds of thousands of jobs per month. We've been having a sub 4% unemployment rate for quarters. Uh, if we look in terms of, we were just talking about the employment cost index. So if we compare what's going on in inflation adjusted term for earnings, those are actually up for the bottom half of the income distribution relative to when this whole thing started. So it's true. But now you're arguing for no cuts again because <laughs> things are going so well that if inflation is the slightest. <laughs> listen, listen. That is so perfectly stated, right? Because you want to say, oh, the economy is so good, this and that. And then you go CPI in the threes. Well, shoot. Well, how, how are you going to make an argument for cuts then at that point? I have a question. And we really haven't slowed a lot of those metrics. Are we restrictive? And, and do cuts make sense? Oh, but I think uh, all the metrics that are important, right? So core PC inflation peaked at 6.5%. We're well below that. Okay. And if we're looking at the month-on-month -month rates, you, I mean, January was clearly outsize the upside but labor still don't we need don't we need unemployment to go up before we feel like we're really making a dent that i don't think we really do i don't think we need to see the kind of unemployment rate rises that historically we've seen because this cycle coming out of covid was just so different than those other cycles i, I disagree fundamentally with people who said you need unemployment i think jim jim might think differently we don't need it but we have always had it in the way of getting inflation down uh, financial true. conditions true. index, as measured by the Chicago Fed, have never deviated from very accommodative during the so-called tightening span. Money is easy. It's not tight. And um, uh, I think that uh, inflation is going to prove to be uh, chronic, persistent, and uh, rates will be higher for much, much, much longer. I mean, you could get really negative, Jim, if, if what you're saying spirals. I mean, the, the, the Fed insists on inflation. People forget that. People forget that the Fed targets a 2% devaluation of one's dollars every single year. That's the, that is what they aim for. And sometimes they overshoot. Yeah. Now, a question about is the Fed restrictive right now? And I would say, yes, the Federal Reserve is restrictive right now. We're talking about Fed funds rate 5.5-ish, somewhere around there, right? And we're talking about a CPI at, let's say, 3.5. So, you know, we could say 200 basis points, uh, Fed funds rate above. So, yes, we are restrictive, right? Um, but with that being said, are we restrictive enough to pull down inflation down to that 2% number? Maybe not. Maybe we need to be at a 6% or 7% number to really get down there ASAP. But the Fed, I think, is very scared of bringing us down fast. 
because that also risks bringing the whole system down really, really fast. So they're trying to play kind of a cutesy, very tough game to play of like being restrictive, but not going too crazy where, you know, not only inflation drops, but then you go potentially into deflation, unemployment climbs massively. That's a messy, messy situation. So they're trying not to do that situation. All right, next one up here, Kramer, Mad Dash, NVIDIA. By the way, you know, Kramer gets a lot of crap all the time. You know, there's like an inverse Kramer index and all those sorts of things. Uh, I'm going to stick up for Kramer here, okay? The first person I think I ever heard talk positively about NVIDIA was actually Kramer. Way, way a long, long, long time ago before NVIDIA was like a household name. That man was speaking very positively about NVIDIA. I heard about it from him and then actually a coworker who I taught. Uh, stock market investing too. Those were the first two people that really put NVIDIA on my radar in a, in a major way. So I want to give him at least uh, some flowers in regards to that because that is one that he's actually been, um, you know, a, a good one he's been on for a long, long time. Do you remember Matt. NVIDIA? Do you remember that? I do. I remember Okay, that. do you remember the piece of 60 Minutes, which is a piece mostly about whether we'd all be taken over by robots? Yeah, sure. I will tell you that here's a piece by UBS and it's talking about dollars, how much they're going to make. Uh, earnings per share to, to 41 following supply chain 41 well david this is cheaper stock it's cheap stock and they're talking about shipment black for blackwell in december now they think that means there's going to be a product hole i think blackwell ships earlier now blackwell is the big one uh that makes it so that uh a lot of people feel they can do video that's what i want when, when people think blackwell they should be thinking that you can in, inject video and then when you want to do inference, it will be able to do the video for it. And that's a rather remarkable thing. Right now, we're very good at commands, at words. But if we get video going, wow. What does that mean? Well, you what, can, are you, what are you actually so saying? You, you, okay, so you want, you want your robot to act uh, like Daniel Craig in Bond. Well, it will watch Daniel Craig, and, he'll, and it'll do it. It'll do it. It'll do it. And I think that what happens when you see that is, wait a second, how did it do that? Well, it just ingested video. It's no longer just print. I mean, right now it can be Moby Dick in a second. Big deal. But when you can put movies in, David, I can project you to be Cary Grant. Really? Or John Garfield. John Garfield is the one that does come up more often. Right. But I'm just saying that video is the next frontier. And if you can be able to make video... Uh, and do things, then you can teach robots to do things that we've never believed. Robots will not talk like this. Robots will talk like, hey, how you doing, partner? <laughs> so you Black, make a, you can program Blackwell robots to do anything. conceivably, when it starts to actually oh, be... I could, have, I could have a joke I could make right now. I don't know if I should make it. I don't think I should make it. Ah, oh, dang, it's a good one, too. Used could be a could leapfrog the technology. Right, and also if you're Amazon, I mean, you can just do it. Yeah, these guys think one of the things that's great about Chance is look, I don't know if you saw it in, in, in the interview, you said, I don't know what people can do with this, but we know that they can have it. So you'll be getting, I tried to look at Getty Images, little stock because Getty Images, they're using a lot of that stuff. Right. But when I when I went to the bar, the NVIDIA bar, uh, with the robot, the robot didn't know much. No. Now yeah, the robot the will be so oh. smart that when I get to Sanko a Mile, it's really just Modelo I'm not, I'm not versus Corona. Not He's not going to say to me, how would you like a Jack Daniels Diet Coke? Just damn it, he keeps bringing up drinking. I can't do it. I can't do the joke. I can't do it. It's so bad. Uh, anyways, guys, appreciate you joining me. Busy day ahead. I'm about to go live on Twitch where I'm a little more uncensored. So if you want to join me for that one, you can join me on that one. Pin comment down there. Much love and have a great day.